a storyteller, so I'm going to start with a story. It's a very, very quick and short story. Just bear with me. There's method to the madness. So in August 2020, I wrote a story about somebody called Mustafa Salah. Mustafa Salah is a Gambian man, a young, ambitious Gambian man. I think he was 25 years old at the time. I don't recall. And the story is simple, right? Um, it was titled, if I remember correctly, it was titled, he, let me look at my slides, sorry, I thought I was going to have slides today. Hold on. Yes, it was called, He Almost Died Migrating to Europe. Now he's warning other Gambians about it. And I guess from the title... So it was called um, He Almost Died Migrating to Europe. Now he's warning other Gambians about it. Most most of our story is simple. He had a very, very simple plan. He lived in this city called, I think it's an urban, it's not a city, maybe a village in Serekunda, um, which is close to the capital city of Gambia. And he was extremely poor. So his plan was very simple. Okay, he'll pack a bag, he'll cross the Mediterranean Sea, he'll go to Europe, right? And he'll study computer science, get money, and send money back to his family. His plan was simple. And when you think how a lot of Gambians are extremely poor. Almost half of the population. Key. Is it my village? Okay. They don't have money, and he just can't kind of that category. His mother sold vegetables in the market. He was extremely poor. And a lot of young boys used to come to Serekunda to say, Guy, if you travel to Europe, you're going to make a lot of money, and everything that you're going through now is going to be a thing of the past. So he thought, okay, it's simple enough, I'll do this. He did not have the data that people die every year going to Europe. He didn't have the data that he could get killed, he could be stabbed, he could get arrested. He just knew, he just had one simple goal, I'm going to blow, and my mother is no longer going to have to sell vegetables in the market. For some unrelated reason, he was in Nigeria late 2016. And so that was when he decided that he's going to make the trip to Europe. Remember that he doesn't particularly have money. So he just started asking people around, how can I get to Niger? Because to get to Europe, you get to Niger, you get to Libya, you cross the Mediterranean Sea, then maybe Italy or Malta or whatever. And people were telling him, okay, to get to Agadez, you have to enter this bus, blah, blah, blah. He got in, got to Libya, stayed with a cousin for a month. Cousin even gave him money so that he could, you know, proceed with his journey. And the way it works is you get into smugglers. They have this big truck that they cover you know, to so protect you so that people don't see you, you get in the truck, whatever. And he got in one of those trucks, right? But it became extremely dangerous. For example, they were constantly attacked by bandits, there was gunfire constantly, he was starved, he didn't have money, he was extorted. He didn't expect that he was going through, he was going to go through all that. Because all the people that used to come to Serekunda, they were just always saying, you make money, you make money, you send money back. Nobody ever said, you could die, you could starve, you could get beaten. So he didn't have that context. Finally, after a while on the road, January 2017, remember that he started this journey in late 2016. The Libyan Coast Guard arrested him and some other people that were traveling in Tripoli. So the Libyan Coast Guard are just people that patrol the waters. They are looking for smugglers and traffickers and preventing trafficking. They arrested him, threw him in a detention center with a lot of other Gambians. I think every year, 35, not every year, sorry, I think between 2016 and 2018, 35,000 Gambians um, made the trip to Europe, just, just to give you a sense that it was a very normal thing, like it was, never, it was not abnormal. Arrested them, they locked them up in cells, he said that it was like hell, they would beat them for any reason, you are breathing too loudly, you are not sleeping, just the most random things. And then, so he was saying that when he was going through all of that in that cell, it just clocked that he was like, all these people that used to come to Serekunda to say, oh, you blow, you blow. How come not one single person said, you might blow, but you also suffer, or you might die, or this could happen to you. Everybody was just saying, you blow, you make money, your family will be proud of you. So he said that that day in the cell, he made up his mind that if he ever got out alive, he was going to tell everybody in Serekunda, his community, that, guys, this thing is extremely dangerous and I don't think he's worth it. So he went around this, um, what's it called, detention center and collected 171 contact details of other Gambians. 
so that he would create something called Youth Against Irregular Migration when he got back safely. He didn't even know if he was going to make it back alive. It was just a conviction because of how much suffering like they had all endured. Fast forward to save you the long story. In April 2017, they all got back to Gambia. They were deported back to Gambia safely. And true to his words, he started this youth against regular migration. Him and the other detainees went around circling down, were knocking people's doors and saying, guys, this irregular migration thing, don't do it. Look at us. See what happened to us. Look at our bodies. Look at how we're suffering. So they kind of gave everybody context. And a lot of people were shocked because all the boys that used to come to Sarakunda were always saying, you blue, you make money, you this, you that. And it was like a thing of, how come not one person ever said, this thing is extremely dangerous? No, not a single human being. Anyway, they didn't have money. They raised a lot of money to do this. Like, they were very, very determined because the suffering that they endured was a lot. So went to radio stations, went to schools, came to places like this, had conversations, were constantly warning people and using their real life experiences to say, guys, do not do this. So there was a lot of conversation, right? And there was a lot of dialogue and a lot of talking, information sharing, educating people, such that a lot of people now became aware. And then when they thought about how they are poor and how they want to cross the sea and go to Europe somehow, they will actually pause and be like, oh, but look at what happened to Mustafa. What if me, I now die? At least him, he came back. So there was a lot of like thinking and pausing and just dialogue, like I don't know if I want to do this. I'm tired and I'm hungry. So there's a lot of, I don't know if I want to do this. And that's, what I'm to, that's the topic that I'm going to talk about today, which is pretty much the power of dialogue and conversations and why it is important in information sharing. So I've used Mustafa Salah, right, as an example, just to bridge the gap and to ease into this story of why it's important to have conversations like Mustafa did, to talk about things, to talk about dialogue, and to effect social change. I think when Abdul Basit was talking about the topic, he told me that it should be about how to effect social change. What Mustafa Salah did in Gambia is social change. He changed the mindset of people about a certain thing that they weren't sure about. That is social change. So if I, like when slave trade was abolished all those many, how many centuries ago, that was social change because people thought it was okay to like, slavery was okay. And then some people and institution came and their minds were changed. Um, when apartheid in South Africa was stopped, that's social change. When technological advancements started coming now, we have laptops, there's TikTok, all of these things, that's social change. Because everyone's mindset keeps changing about things. There are things about cultures and traditions that you now suddenly kind of leave behind. Feminism is a kind of social change because you suddenly start questioning things like, oh, why can't the woman come and stand in front and talk to people? All these little examples are social change. And my digits of today is just come and tell you how talk talk helps to improve things, to create social change, to make things better. What is the point of all this talk talk, this dialogue, this gist? What does it really do? Number one, knowledge sharing. I will not talk too much on that because I already used Mustafa Salah. He just came and okay. So he came, shared the information, and everybody was suddenly more aware, and everybody was suddenly more careful. That is the importance of dialogue and conversations. Things that you didn't know before, you suddenly know. Why? Because somebody just came and told you based on their own real life experience, and suddenly you have more knowledge, and you can make more informed decisions. Second, empathy building. One thing that is super important when you want to change anything, whether it's an institution, a person's mind, whatever it is, is empathy building. How do you build empathy? In the case of Mustafa Salah, it was, look at me, see how I look. I've lost a lot of weight. See the scars on my body. See the guys, see what we went through. You are using your personal experience to convince someone about something such that they can put themselves in your shoe. So even if it's something that you don't understand or you can't relate to, you suddenly are able to empathize because you cannot imagine yourself. So as a young boy there in Serekunda that saw Mustafa and what they went through, even though it's not his experience, but like seeing it, he's like, ah, this could have been me. So that's, conversations does that because you suddenly can just picture yourself in that scenario and like, oh, I don't know if I should have done this or I don't know if this is good. That's very important for conversations. Another good example, right, is the... MSAS movement that happened. Some people did not have any experience with the police, but they saw videos online, right? You don't need to experience it personally. Once you see someone's real life story that, oh, see what happened to this guy, you can immediately picture yourself as a young boy that's almost, this 
can be new. That's the importance of conversations and dialogue. Just put yourself in that scenario and it automatically makes sense. Even if you have not relate, even if you can't relate personally, you can empathize. Conflict resolution. That's very interesting. So a very good or interesting thing about dialogue and conversations is that it can help to facilitate resolution of conflict. I think I want to use this example. We, ha we don't really have a strong example in Nigeria. So I have to go to Rwanda. In Rwanda, during the genocide that happened between April and June in 1994, if you don't know what Rwandan genocide is, 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 the summary is that there was one particular tribe in Rwanda that killed another tribe. It went on for days and 800,000 people died. It was very chaotic and traumatizing. And one of the things that the Rwandan government did at the time was they created this, I've forgotten what they called it, I think it was the Chaka Court, I'm not pronouncing it well, but what they did was that they gave the perpetrators a chance to publicly confess their crimes and they gave the victims a chance to also talk about how it impacted them. Now it wasn't a foolproof plan because it doesn't automatically make everything better, but it gives a chance for open dialogue, for healing, for maybe even forgiveness, for reconciliation. And that's the power of conversations. What if everybody just kept quiet after 800,000 people died and nobody said anything and everybody just moved on with their lives? There is no room for healing, for openness. And so when it comes to conversations, there's a possibility for healing. Same thing with, I keep coming back to answers. That's the example that comes to my mind in Nigeria. A lot of people were talking about it within their circles, online. I don't know if that facilitated healing, but it definitely helped with resolution. Because suddenly, there was, there was a thing where people were saying, are you sure this happened to you? But when there are like 50 other people saying, yes, it happened to me, you suddenly feel like there's a resolution there that, okay, I'm not crazy, I'm not the only one. And that only happened because there were numerous conversations about people saying, okay, me too, okay, me too, this happened here. This happened in Portacos, in Abuja, in Lagos, in Calabar, it wasn't, isolated. So that's super important. Another thing is challenging status quo. And what that simply means is when you have multiple dialogues and conversations because you plan to change how something is, what that does is it challenges how things are currently. So when you are trying to change things, you can't be comfortable just because the system works. So you can't sit down and be like, I'm not going to try to change anything or do anything because everything works. It was because I think it was in the 19th century, where somebody woke up and, or a group of people woke up and said, wait, how come women cannot even vote? That's challenging status quo. He's just asking questions because people were comfortable with the fact that only men could vote. But it took a couple of conversations that, wait, wait, actually was there if women vote. So that's the power of conversations. You start to challenge how things are normally done. And then you start to realize that even the way some things are done don't particularly make sense. So that's why, same thing with answers. Everybody had been experiencing like boys, I mean police officers stopping boys, also women in pockets. But then it took a couple of people to be like, wait, how come these people are always collecting money? How come these people are always doing this? Like it, you have to start challenging that status quo and that's why it's important to talk. I've been saying talk, talk, talk and dialogue and dialogue and conversations. But dialogue and conversations in the context of what me I'm talking about, right? It's not just me standing here now and talking or you telling your neighbor that, ah, this thing happened to me or the police stopped me. It exists in multiple forms, right? One of the forms of dialogue is protest, like the need to protest, like the answer protest. That is a form of dialogue. It's not necessarily just telling your neighbor, guy, this is what is happening. It's also telling the government, telling wider people outside the country. It's protesting. It's also traditional media, right? It's like, oh, like the, I forget his name now, the first guy, the Dr. Bamiboye, that spoke, Bamiboye, Okay, yeah, Dr. Bamiboye, sorry about that. So he has a column that he writes every time, and there's a particular topic that he's passionate about. That is dialogue. He's writing about it in a popular Nigerian newspaper that many people are probably going to read and see it and be like, I just question things. So it doesn't have to be talking to anybody. It could be an article, it could be going on the radio, it could be in TV, it could even be social media. You care about, I don't know, you care about um, FinTech. So it could be as simple as going on social media and consistently tweeting about FinTech. That's dialogue, that's conversation, and that's very important. So there are different forms and it comes in different ways.
Um, I think when people think about effective change and how to change how things are, how to be better, they always feel like, oh, you have to be on big team, you have to go on TV, you have to be like Dr. Gamma and write one article somewhere. You know, it's actually small pockets of little things that help you make change. Because remember that change is long and hard. The first time that we publicly recorded people fighting for women's rights was like in 1848. And when in 2023, I was still fighting for women's rights. When I die, they'll still be fighting for women's rights. When you die, they'll still be fighting for women's rights. Now imagine all the people that have been fighting for it since. It is a very tedious and long process, and you have to start small and do it little by little. So you can't expect that, okay, well, me, the first I care about is nobody should raise our school fees again. That's the social change I'm going to fight for. You now maybe do one talk today and expect that automatically nobody will ever change. Like, no, we have to continue fighting. Next year, people will still be talking about how they increase their school fees. The year after, like that, like that. It's a continuous fight. So start small. Don't overthink. Don't think to be that. To make do social change, you have to be in the public place. You have to carry one placard somewhere. No. Start with your friends. Talk to your friends. Feel how they make change in their own personal life. Have conversations with them. Most of us are didn't do anything dramatic when he came back from that detention center in Gambia. He just went to his neighbors. I was knocking. I was like, we are from social so, so community. This is what we want to talk to you about. He wasn't went and protested somewhere. It was just small, 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 until you grew. So when you're thinking about causes that you care about, things that are passionate about, don't overthink it. We are not going anywhere to carry anything. No, we are, we are going on the radio. We are writing an article. You are posting something on Instagram every day. It's okay. It's as simple as that. And all those little pockets of things help to make like the, you know, bigger change that you're looking for. Oh, yeah. So, what are the issues or the problems with dialogue and conversations when you want to change things? Because I've been talking since and saying how good everything is and how you have to start small. But there are some issues with it. One, which I've already talked about, is that it takes a long time and you can get tired and bored. Number two, something I like to call echo chambers. So, there's this thing that when you're having conversations about a particular topic you care about, you feel like everybody around you agrees with the topic or understands the topic but when you go outside and touch grass you realize that you are living within just the really what's the word just people that agree with you yes men so there are some people that let me think of a real life example um i had this like when i used to work at it's a publication called stairs business right i did a story about you know mental health there was a girl a guy who had schizophrenia or whatever and you know he was he, he was just not treated well and i remember that i had someone who read the article and sent me a message i was like and eh, that am i really sure of what i'm saying because she knows that a lot of people are mentally aware and that people should have known from the way the boy was acting that there was something wrong with him mentally and i had to tell the person in a very nice way obviously that Better go outside and touch grass. How many people will see someone acting the way this guy is acting and immediately think, oh, he has schizophrenia? The only thing they are going to say, this one is mad, take him to church, take him. like, no, these things that me. So sometimes when you're having these conversations within your bubble, you always feel like everybody thinks like you. And that's a trap that people fall into when they are trying to have, ch um, you know, when they are trying to dialogue. So you have to constantly question things and step outside and ask yourself, Am I really trying to effect change or has it become a thing where I'm now surrounded by people who think like me and I'm stuck? Moving on from that example, there's also something called power dynamics. When you're trying to effect change, sometimes you are just a random student in your small dorm room writing one at school somewhere, writing a tweet. The government can come tomorrow and ban Twitter and you cannot write your tweet again. Same thing when answers happen, they were like, okay, they are protesting, okay, then I'm going to shoot them. And that is it, like, so all those little things that you are trying to do, there's someone high up somewhere that can just be like, that late, I'm like, let this person get out. So you have to keep that in mind as a challenge that comes with conversation. Most of us are like, somebody would have dropped me, I bet get out. You know, they're just little things like that. There's also misinformation. The same way you are going around telling people that, ah, guys, don't go to Europe. This is what happened to us. And that person is like, God, John, nothing will happen. What about this 
sky that blue. So there's a lot of like misinformation that you have to combat when you are telling people that enter this dream, you know, it happened to me. And that person is like, but it didn't happen to me, so I don't know if you are lying. So there's a lot of misinformation that you kind of have to deal with when that is happening. There's also the language barrier. And I don't even mean maybe you need to speak Igbo to someone that you're trying to talk to or your back. I just mean you haven't found the right tools or way to properly communicate with someone. You cannot go to someone with a different lifestyle than you and start preaching to them using your own mindset. They're not going to understand you. That if they don't want to listen to you. So there's a communication barrier when it comes to you. Like if I want to talk to someone about climate change now, someone that generally doesn't care or has other big problems, I'm not going to come and say, oh, climate change is really I will look for like a real life example that the person can relate to, maybe the flooding that happened in one place in Lekki or something. I will go and start there. Do you know that climate change affects that what you're thinking? So you have to figure out how to communicate properly with people like that. I think finally, finally, in all of these things about conversations and dialogue, dialogue has to be very, very respectful. Yes, there's room for fast post dialogue. Sometimes respect doesn't work. But a lot of the time when you're trying to communicate change to people, you have to be very respectful. So many, many years ago, right, I was working with this, um, should I say not profit? My friend owns a not profit, uh, not for profit, and what they do is basically all things in relation to like women's rights and sexual violence. And she called me and she said, okay, Aisha, you're a storyteller. I think that my trainees have a problem with stories. They don't know how to tell people stories to make them join our cause. So I went to the, the girls, the trainees, and I said, okay, how far, what's the problem? Tell me what happened. They said, oh, they're trying to sensitize the community about the dangers of HIV AIDS, especially in relation to sexual violence. And the women are doing anyhow, they're not listening to them, blah, 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 blah. And I said, okay, how did you go to these women to talk to them? What was the what was the approach? They said yeah, they just went now, they started talking to the women. And I was like, oh I'm out of time. Okay, okay, fast forward, fast forward, fast forward, I'm sorry. And I was like, how did you talk to those women? They were like, oh, they just went and they started talking to those women. So I was like, wait, did you not go to the ballet of the community and say, oh that's that this is what we are doing, this is we are. You just went and started talking to them, they said yes. Yeah. I'm like, oh that's very disrespectful. <laughs> I like that extremely disrespectful. I don't know if that sound was for that's why I said sorry. And I told them that when it comes to dialogue, you have to be very, very, very respectful. You can't enter a community that they don't know and start saying you die of HIV AIDS. You have to talk to the ballet and say, oh, that is what we're trying to do. We have and respect them in communication. Fast forward, fast forward, I'm speaking on many slides now. What you should do right now, after all my long talk, if you have a particular cause that you care about and you want to effect social change in. Number one, don't overthink it. Start you know, tweet about that thing you care about. Continuously tweet about it. Write articles if you can write articles. Talk to your neighbor about it. Join organizations that are already doing the thing you care about. Sometimes you feel like you have to be the one to mobilize. No, you don't. Don't join an organization that's already doing it. Have those conversations. Uh, join the Basics team on this TED Talk as they are you know, doing things like this. Volunteer 